Uh, welcome to the uh, fourth, fourth session um, of this uh, workshop on iSocial interactions. I've had some feedback from the last session from people who have sort of been here for the first time, and that's totally fine because everything's recorded and you can look up the recordings later that uh, we, they don't have like, a, like too much context for why we're organizing this workshop. Uh, so we have to... The organizers of this workshop includes me, Helen, Felicity McCormick is our lead, and a few others that you can look up uh, when you see the recordings. Uh, we are here to A, build the community, uh, build up our iSocian community, make sure there's more interactions between all the researchers working here, and also at the end of this workshop to write up a white paper that summarizes uh, the communities. Uh, ideas on iSocial interactions. And that's hopefully something we can use for, use as fodder for proposals, use to learn about data gaps and uh, maybe try and fill them in into the future. Um, so this is the fourth session and it's gonna focus on iSocial interactions for sea level projections. Um, so the, like I said, the aims of the overall workshop is to identify knowledge gaps surrounding process that govern ocean driven of ice sheets across a range of scales, and we've already saw a few talks uh, on that. And then it's also to identify options to address these knowledge gaps, and that could be through observing, parameterizing, or modeling ice social interactions. Um, just a reminder that all these sessions are recorded and will be posted on YouTube shortly. Uh, Helen probably has a link that she can post, otherwise I can do that later. Oh, thank you. Uh, and there's going to be uh, breakouts following these sessions, and uh, the ideas from these breakouts have copious notes from the last one, and all of those will be synthesized into a report by the committee, and they'll maybe take a few months. Uh, and more info on this is on the JCIOI, which stands for the Joint Committee on Ice Ocean Interactions. Uh, feel free to browse their website. There's a lot more information there. So this uh, session more specifically is on uh, the role of ice ocean interactions in sea level projections. So uh, they've got uh, a whole lot of different topics. We've got two fantastic speakers, Dan Goldberg and Carolyn, who are experts in this, and uh, will hopefully give you a great introduction to the field and an insight into the specific research uh, they're working on. Uh, so let me introduce uh, the speakers. First up, we've got Dan Goldberg. Dan's a reader in glaciology in the School of Geoscience at Edinburgh. Prior to moving there, he did his PhD at New York's Curon Institute of Mathematics. I, you're the second person I'm introducing has been there. Uh, so he followed this with a postdoc at NOAA GFDL and an NSF uh, postdoc fellowship at MIT. He's mostly interested in uh, interactions between Antarctic ice shelves and, and the surrounding oceans and the incorporation of remotely sensed data into ice sheet models. Mm -hmm. And more generally, mm -hmm. he's interested in the application of mathematical and numerical models to learn more about ice sheets and glaciers in the Earth system. Uh, so Dan will go first. And then next up, we'll have Carolyn, who will speak about research directions for large scale modeling of ice ocean interactions. Uh, Carolyn studies the interaction between ice sheets and the oceans uh, and develops coupled modeling approaches uh, for the U.S. Department of Energy's Energy Exascale Earth System model. You'll hear a lot about it. It's, e it's abbreviated E3SM. She's also looked at ice ocean boundary layer process using ocean turbulence modeling, large eddy simulations, and uh, oceanographic observations. She got her PhD from uh, UC Santa Cruz up the coast from here uh, as an NSF graduate research fellow and a UC President's Fellow in 2018 and she's been a research scientist at LANO since 2020. So um, I'll just leave that there, let our uh, speakers go. And Dan, uh, let me know if you can't share your screen. Um, yeah, I'm about to try and share it just now. I need to figure out which my desktops is gonna be, sort of, you can see, so, so just give me a moment. Yeah, no problem. <laughs> So, let's see, I'll share this one, and 
Perfect. Okay, can you hear me? Yes. And I can see my screen. So please forgive the minimalist style of the title screen. Um, I, in the program, Carolyn's name appeared first. And when we met to discuss what we were gonna say, we understood that she would be talking first and not me. And so um, some of the things I'm gonna say kind of play off of what I thought she was going to say, but, but that's okay. We'll, we'll, it'll all sort of like work itself out in the session. And so I, I realized that I hadn't saved my slides onto Dropbox and I was just scrambling to make a title slide and ran out of time. So, I, so for, please forgive that, but uh, so I'm Dan Goldberg, University of Edinburgh. I believe I have 20 minutes. Um, so I'll try to stick to it. That uh, tell me if I tell me, hurry up, hurry me up if I need to. And I'm going to talk about um, modeling perspective of ice ocean interactions, sort of geared towards um, thinking about sea level rise. Uh, I guess similarly to Helen's going to, I mean Carolyn's going to talk about the same thing, but I think we're going to talk about slightly different things. So justifying two speakers in a session. Um, so it, I know that everyone here, everyone tuned in knows this already, but I still think it's good to give context. We, we care about ice sheet ocean interactions because there's been extensive ice volume loss from the Greenland and Antarctic ice sheets over the past, um, over the past several decades, focused along the margin of the ice sheets and in particular in certain catchments. And this has led to rates of sea level rise that are currently increasing. And it's, I think, I don't think it's a contentious thing to say that this is, there's an ocean trigger to this, um, to this ice loss. Because, and we, we, we know this because areas where there's strong thinning correspond to, to areas of strong ocean forcing and loss of ice shelf, ice shelf mass or frontal retreat as shown by these two um, very nice high impact studies. So why would thinning of ice shelves lead to thinning of that should say grounded ice? And why does it matter? That first question, it centers around what's known as ice shelf buttressing. And I chose to show rather than a more recent image, an image from Rob Thomas's paper from 1979. Because when I was doing my PhD, uh, Rob's papers and this figure really helped me to understand um, and intuit ice shelf buttressing. There is, I'm gonna change this to a, um, to a laser. We, there is a, uh, an ice sheet pushing ice, pushing ice into an ice shelf. And the ice shelf is grabbing onto whatever it can, margins, ice rises, and pushing back. With the, with the other side of that being, if you thin the ice shelf or remove it, this ice here will move faster, flow faster, and there will be thinning and some grounding line retreat. So that was before Photoshop, that, that image was made. Um, since then, there's been more clever ones to be made, but they all kind of show similar things. Uh, the other component is the marine ice sheet instability uh, hypothesis, and which is premised on the fact that all else equal, the deeper the bed where the ice goes afloat, that is the grounding line, the greater the tendency of the ice to thin and sort of flow more quickly across the grounding line and leading, lead to more grounding line retreat. In a situation where the ice, where the grounding line, where the ice sheet sits on a bed that deepens inland, that sets up a recipe for instability because a small amount of retreat to die shell thinning can lead to greater tendency to thin, greater retreat and sort of snow, uh, sort of a, a process that feeds on itself. And we're well aware that uh, sort of around the margin of Antarctica and Greenland, there's areas that where the bed is below sea level and deepens inland. And there is the thought that this, these processes might play a strong role in, in the coming centuries. Now, I know this talk is, or the, 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 the sort of remit of the, of the session is sea level rise. But I think it's important to just say, and I didn't want to let it, left it, leave it unsaid, ice loss and sea level are not the, import, the only important impacts of ice ocean interactions. Ice melt can release trace metals like iron, which is a limiting factor in the Southern Ocean and sort of like forms the basis of, of the food web on the continental shelf. Input of fresh water at depth can lead to upwelling of nutrients in the, in the Southern Ocean and in Greenland, 
And there's been studies that show the importance of this, including a study that, re that really showed like if there's no melting on, an ice on, an, on a continental shelf, similar to the Amundsen, there is absolutely, there's almost no productivity as well. So it's, it's really important to, I think, just keep that in mind when we talk about these things. But back to the sort of like the main focus, the remit, you know, part of the remit of this session is to talk about how, how, plot, how, how models um, implement ice-ocean interactions. And I'm kind of retreading some things that have been talked about in previous days, but I think that's okay because I'm just sort of emphasizing it. So as Nico Jordan was saying yesterday, all ocean models that implement ice-ocean interactions implement some, some version of these three equations from Holland and Jenkins. And that's not what I'll talk about. I'll talk about the fact that, as Nico also said, in a 3D ocean model, these far field properties that force the, th the um, three equations have to come from sort of a grid, from a 3D grid. And that can cause issues if those grid cells are, for instance, too thick, because, and this raises questions as to whether large scale ocean models can actually represent near ice properties accurately. I also wanted to show, I chose to show these images from Veronique Dunsero's 2014 paper, modeling uh, melt rates under Pine Island ice shelf, because I think these rib structures here really exemplify what I'm talking about. The sort of discretized aspect of the Z coordinate ocean model is what leads to these rib structures that may or may not be sort of harmful to projections. And I also want to show this because it's a sort of comparison of two sort of a dichotomy in, in, in modeling of isocean interactions. There's kind of two camps on how to represent these exchange velocities, which do in general depend on the frictional velocity, which is just a measure of ocean isocean drag. Some people take the view that we can never, with an ocean model, with a 3D ocean model, actually know what isocean drag actually is. And so we just set it to a constant. The other camp sort of realizes the importance of um, well, realizes that, that caveat, but also wants to explore the, um, you, doesn't sit, it doesn't sit well with them to just set U star constant. So they let it depend on ocean velocity, large scale ocean velocity in some way or another. Um, so there are alternative coordinate systems. And, and I guess that, that sort of like that velocity also sort of exacerbates this issue here. So there's alternative co alternate coordinate systems um, like, like sigma terrain following and density coordinates. Um, that could add higher resolution near the ice ocean boundary layer, but those come with their own problems, either at the ice front or the grounding line. So nothing's perfect. If you're an ice modeler and you want to sort of really accurately model, you know, represent ice shelf melt as your ice model changes and your ice shelf changes its geometry, you might start, you might look into ocean modeling and the person realizes that compared to ice sheet modeling, ocean modeling is very expensive. At required resolutions, century scale modeling, takes maybe weeks rather than hours. And so ice sheet modelers seek physically motivated parameterizations of varying levels of complexity. At the sort of low end of, of the complexity spectrum is, um, well, that's what's being shown here in this paper by David Lillian, which isn't to take away from David, it's just, you know, what he used. But these, these lines represent depth melt um, relationships, linear, as you can see, that, and all they're really trying to say is that sort of as the base of the ice shelf gets deeper and deeper, or as the ice shelf gets thicker and thicker, um, melt rates increase because they're exposed to warmer water. If you're wondering about the sort of like scatter plot, that's, that's just satellite data, data that's being presented. That's not a parameterization. So as I said, there's different levels of complexity. I'm not going to go into them because there's a really nice paper by um, Clara Burgard in the Cryosphere Discussions that gives a overall, that, that really talks about all of them. Um, from the point, uh, I just put this slide in, this image here to show that this sort of thing is done for Greenland modeling as well. Um, for tidewater modeling, um, parameterizations are developed based on runoff and, uh, and thermal forcing and sort of fit to retreat rates and, and sort of parameterizations which hopefully, hopefully carry forth over the next century are used. Now, sort of stepping up in complexity, um, so there are, there's a growing number of approaches which use fully sort of, sort of fully developed ice dynamics and a three dimensional ocean model. And these are what these, these approaches are referred to as ice, ice ocean coupling. There's a lot of different groups doing it. Most of the efforts kind of 
um, sort of the thing that distinguishes them is how they kind of deal with the fact that their ocean cavity is changing over time, which doesn't happen in normal ocean modeling. I won't talk about that, but I will talk about something that I think is going to become more of an issue as we take these coupled models from the sort of idealized cases to the realistic cases and try to make projections with them. Because it seems that, well, they're difficult to initialize. It's difficult to initialize even an ice sheet model to a sort of fully transient dynamic state. But when you throw the ocean in, anything that the ice sheet model does wrong seems to be amplified. And so these transients seem, at least in a study that, that in, in one study, in a sort of a sort of a localized study, these transients seem to last for several decades. Whether or not that's true everywhere, it's, it's difficult to say, but, it, but, they, but if we care about those for several decades, initialization is something we need to focus on. Another remit is to talk about how observations inform ice, ice ocean models. And this is not at all exhaustive, but I want to talk about a few things. So satellite observations, satellite altimetry, and satellite velocities have developed to the point where we can get time averaged, but really highly spatially varying patterns of melt rate under ice shelves. So what these figures are showing are, for one thing, from satellite, we do see a channelized sort of feature of high melt under dots and ice shell. And then the rest are just efforts to sort of match that with an ocean model with sort of um, what we think are the right geometry of ice shelf. And what the main thing that came out of it was if we don't represent the dependence of U star on ocean velocity, we don't get that channelized feature at all. Um, there's oceanographic constraints as well, and those have the advantage of sort of not having a lot of the assumptions that satellite inversions do, but also um, give, give more sort of um, snapshot estimates that can be useful for calibrating um, variability in, in regional ocean models as done by in, in the Caitlin Norton paper. And I just wanted to show this sort of like, I, I, put, I just put this here, um, this sort of submersible data from Pierre Dutrio. Um, not so much because I, I don't think it's actively being used to calibrate ice ocean models, at least not regional ones, but it does really show what is capable, what type of observations are capable of. And, the, and I, you know, to the point where maybe they can be used to make our models better. So something Nico, Nico Jourdain talked about, again, also in his talk yesterday, was the sort of deficiency of ocean models to get melt right near the grounding zone, near the grounding line. And I'm gonna talk about that, but sort of consider the implications that that has in coupled models. Um, and this is the most detailed thing that I'll do after that. Hopefully it'll go quick. So what I've done here is looking only at Pine Island Ice Shelf, I downloaded data from um, Sushil's recent estimate of melt rates from satellite and kind of generated a, a, a density scatter plot of melt versus depth. And then I did the same thing with a model that I've been running, sort of restricting the output to, um, to Pine Island ice shelf. And what I see is that above 600 meters, the model provides reasonable estimates of melt versus depth. A little bit high here, but I've only set, that's because I've set the sort of drag coefficient to be high because below 600 meters in my model with varying U star, melt falls away with depth. And so that's not what happens in the satellite data. So even though over sort of like most of the ice shelf by area, things are looking okay, these, there's low melt rates at the grounding level. And when I feed that into a coupled model, um, of the Amundsen, things look all right for Thwaites because that didn't, that sort of thing didn't happen there. But at Pine Island, what we see is like extensive grounding line re-advance because I've tried to use the best velocities and the best geometry available. And those kind of demand really high melt rates at the grounding line. And that's what Sushio calculated. But the, but the model wasn't uh, providing that. And so that led to thickening and then regrounding and then advance. So that sort of like deficiency was amplified very strongly. So even when total melt matches oceanic observations and melt mo over most of the ice shelf is larger than observations, it's still too small at the grounding line. If we don't get melt rate right in the right places, coupled ice ocean hindcasts and forecasts will fail, even if the ice sheets do exactly what they're supposed to do. 
So the final remit was to talk about, you know, potential directions for development. And I'm going to kind of stick with the theme of what's going on near the grounding line, because I think it's an important one to talk about. And I know Carolyn's going to talk about a lot more sort of general aspects of things that need to be done. So I think that's okay. So I guess I'll pose the question, are 3D, are 3D ocean models actually able to represent the ice ocean boundary layer? Never mind resolution, what if we had enough of that? Um, I get, so these figures, I mean, the two figures that I've shown, uh, Sue Shields, uh, Melt Rakes from Pine Island, Noel's email from Dotson and Crossin and the sort of model simulations there, they do show that in some places is, it, it is right to have exchange velocity varying with velocity um, or sort of U star varying with, with velocity. But in other places, it might not be appropriate. And there might be sort of some relationship between velocity and surroundings and exchange velocity that we, that we haven't quite figured out yet. It's kind of similar to what Rebecca Jackson was saying yesterday, that the way we've calibrated these things in one area might not hold up in others. Another question, um, maybe option for development. Do we need better undershelf topography near the grounding lines? I mean, is this, is it simply that our bed isn't deep enough and so the water isn't able to flow fast enough and so it's not capturing these high melt rates? That might be the case, but it might be that pretty much all ocean models are just insufficient to deal better with thin columns or to deal appropriately with thin columns than we need to, to do better. Another thing that Nico was saying yesterday. So I'm just kind of emphasizing that. I drew this solid black line to emphasize that the typical approach to this issue, oh, the melt rate isn't high enough because water's not moving fast enough or there's not enough transport because the column is too thin, is to dig the bathymetry. That's what a lot of people do. And I think that that might be okay for certain purposes. But if you think about kind of retreat of, ground, of, of this grounding line over several hundred kilometers, I mean, are you then going to fill the bed back in that you dug? And if you, if you don't, is that right? Can you leave that big bathymetry in? And if you do, how is that mass conservative? So I think probably both of these things need to, address, need to be addressed. And again, with the grounding zone, I, I, I'm, I'm convinced that we just don't understand it well enough. But I think there's non-hydrostatic things going on. Um, new sort of theoretical research from, um, from Kasia War Warburton really suggests that in some places, tidal elastic interactions could move water upstream of the grounding line and that water could potentially be warm. And this, the, the, all the sort of the study, the work by uh, Carolyn, looking at the Willens grounding line, shows that we really don't understand the thermodynamics and the fluid mechanics of what's going on there as well. Um, there could be massive amounts of subglacial water pouring into the grounding line, which don't change melt rates overall, but could drive large melt rates in the grounding zone. And if that's true, if there's subglacial channels, not just sort of distributed melt, but subglacial channels exiting, like entering the entering ice shelf cavities, um, recent work by Alex Robel suggests that, you know, these channels might be of, su of sufficient geometry that warm water could actually make its way into it and cause melt rates. And we know from Rob and Rosie's 2017 paper that melting near the grounding line is bad for sea level rise. And finally, I don't know where this, where else this fits, but I think, but a lot of the methods, I think all of the methods that we use to assess melt rates from um, satellite assume hydrostasy, and that's just not the case in the grounding zone. So there's this place where we don't really understand anything. I think we need more theory, but we also need more data if possible. And I should say, I think a load, a load of that data is about to come out from the Thwaites Project melt, but I don't think it's quite out yet. Um, finally, uh, I want to just, I don't know where else this fits in, but um, I think we need to kind of take a pragmatic approach to deciding where it's important to rep best represent ice ocean interactions. This image was kind of shown a little bit by Nico yesterday, but I want to sort of, I'm showing like the full thing. Um, studies recently that look, that do sort of comprehensive sensitivities, they do show that there's wide swathes of the underside of ice shelves where there's no real, it doesn't really matter if we get melt rates right or not. And it might be that more studies like this are needed in order to focus 
the questions that we ask to the places where they matter the most. I guess this is just to say, like, this is not limited to ice sheet studies. You could actually look at how, how sensitive the uh, isocean interactions are to bathymetry as well. So that's, and I get rather than saying, ask the models, modelers, which I put at the top of that slide, it's, re it's really just asking the models. Asking the models, where do you care where we get things right or not? So the final thoughts, just all at once, and you can cut me off anytime. Um, I think it's no secret, isocean interactions play a key role in ice loss driven sea level change. And there's a lot of different approaches used in, you know, ice sheet modeling coupled ice ocean models to understand the climate impacts. Ocean models do a fair job of capturing the melt response, but struggle in some, I would say, important locations. The physics of the grounding zone is not fully captured by models or observations, and this may limit our ability to predict rapid ice loss in the future. And there's lots of questions, but maybe we can pare those down by looking first at comprehensive sensitivities in order to prioritize. Thank you very much. That's awesome, Dan. Thank you. That was an awesome summary. Um, yeah, uh, we've got a couple of minutes for questions. If anyone's got any burning questions, we can also wait to the end of the meeting. Feel free to unmute yourself and ask questions if you have any. Well, um, yeah. sure. Uh, so I, uh, that was a great talk. I th really appreciate it. Um, you kind of laid out a lot of the sort of the unknowns and, and opportunities for progress that are both have to do with sort of our, our process understanding, the way that process understanding is described in models and in the sort of initial conditions um, or kind of basic observations. Do you have a sense as to like, and this no right answer here, but how long it'll be before we understand each of, or improve our understanding in each of those three domains to the point that we are actually able to reproduce appropriately the ocean's um, driving of sea level rise? Oh boy. Um, well, the short answer is no, I don't know. But let me, so the, but I, but I should say more than, I should try to say more than that. Um, so the three domains, I can't, I, I was trying to find, I was grasping for a pen. I should, I should show my, I guess I should show my face. Um, I was grasping for a pen while you were at, while you were asking the question. So sort of initialization, grounding zone, and sort of theory, grounding, grounding zone theory, and observations. Tim, is that, is that fair? Sure, sure. I, I was yeah. thinking, I mean, you described them in terms of, you know, process understanding, the way those processes are described in models and initial conditions. Uh, yeah. Okay, if, okay. That just, I mean, that's one way to parse it, but, I, but maybe there are, you have others are, that are different. Uh, so how long would it take? Usually takes the scale, the, t the scale of a sort of the time scale of a large grant or a PhD studentship, doesn't it, to make, to make an advance. Um, and I think all of this takes probably at least two PhD studentships. So I, there's a, I think I, there's a lot that I left out about stuff that either I know is going on or, or don't know is going on. The work that, the, what, the data that they are hopefully bringing back from the MELT project under Thwaites, I think that's gonna be a huge step change in process understanding. It's going to address whether there actually is loads of subglacial melt pouring into the into the Thwaites cavity, and it's going to hopefully address how you know the sort of turbulence. I don't know if they have turbulence sensors, but let's just I'll, I'll pretend they do. Um, how sort of turbulence in the ice in a thin ice ocean column relates to melt rates at, at the surface. So I'm I'm hopeful that sort of that large volume of data that's going to come back in a few years is going to make a big difference in our process under, in our in, the, in our understanding of the processes and given how expensive it is to sort of you know drill through an ice shelf i guess um caroline could probably attest to that uh, i think there will be sort of it's probably there's there will probably be sort of like you know episodic 
increases in our understanding of, of, the, of the sort of like the grounding zone, which I think is a process that we really need to understand. So I, I would think that in several years, we're going to increase our ability, our understanding of that by a lot. Um, I think in terms of incorporating these things into models, I, I, think, I think change is just going to be, improvements are just going to be sort of steady because people are always working on these things. I think there's going to be some talks tomorrow uh, discussing like, you know, how best to, to, to model ice ocean melt without a 3D ocean model. Nico was already hinting at that in his talk yesterday that we should sort of parameterize the grounding zone with some sort of plume model. And I think that probably means that that is being done by someone somewhere. So I would guess, you know, it, it would be order, you know, several years and less than a decade before we're actually able to model this type of thing. Whether or not we think that sort of tidal interactions are important or not, I think someone has to decide that before someone goes full bore on that. But I don't think it would take very long to do if it was decided that it was important. Um, initial conditions, this is, I think this is difficult because we have to kind of think back to like how people did this in, in other fields. Um, numerical weather modeling has been the sort of like the hindcast versus forecast problem. That's been something that they've been working on for 50 years. They, they, they you know, around, I think like the 2000s, they find they implemented 40 bar and, and they're still kind of working on faster ways, better ways to solve that problem. So I think that might be the thing that takes the longest to do. And that's unfortunate because, you know, if, if it takes 30 years, we need to know what's going to happen in 30 years today. But so I think any efforts in that, in that direction will be good, but I don't think it'll be done right for some, for quite some time. Thanks, Dan. Great question, Tim. Thank you, Dan. Was a great answer. Um, next up, we'll get uh, Carolyn. Um, hope you can share your slides. And, uh... Okay, are we coming through? Yeah. So I think no, no, wait, no. that's a press share. <laughs> Two clicks. Okay. Now we're good? Yes. Yes, perfect. Okay, great. Well, first, I just want to say thanks to Helen and Sushil for organizing this session. And thanks, Dan, for kicking um, the session off with a great talk and making my job of introducing these concepts a little bit easier. Um, so I have titled my talk Research Directions for Large-Scale Modeling of Ice-Ocean Interactions. So my bend with this presentation is going to be a little bit more towards large-scale modeling considerations um, and a little bit more of a bird's eye view. Um, I have only listed myself as the author of this talk because in some ways this is an opinion piece, but I really want to just acknowledge that there's a vast body of literature that's gone into bringing us to kind of, you know, bringing the field to where it is right now, where we're starting to explore some feedbacks between ice sheet dynamics and ocean dynamics. And um, so I won't be able to do that, that body of literature justice in this very high level talk. Sorry, waiting to see if it will advance. Okay, here we go. So um, I'm gonna skip over a lot of the motivation um, for doing this, this work of trying to you know, improve our, our projections of land ice contributions to sea level. Um, but I do just want to point out that there are kind of a variety of forcings that are external to ice sheet dynamics that play a role in determining sea level contribution. Um, and since this is a, a meeting focused on ice ocean interactions, I'm not really going to cover all of these um, different aspects, but I just kind of wanted to point out here that, you know, while we have kind of traditionally forced ice sheet models with um, output from climate models to do with, you know, controls on ice sheet surface mass balance, like air temperature and precipitation, um, and then ice sheet basal mass balance, like ocean temperature and velocity. 
Um, there are other controls that are important. Um, fortunately, on the kind of iceberg calving front, that's largely determined by the internal ice, internal ice stresses um, and some of the kind of other surface and basal mass balance processes. And fortunately, we don't have to worry too much about other climate and weather forcing like dynamic sea surface height variations and storms because those tend to be a lot smaller than those kind of internal stress factors. So that's convenient. Um, but we do need to be concerned about um, some controls on grounding line location, like glacial isostatic adjustment and local sea level. And I won't really go into that literature here, but I think some of the considerations that I'll bring up are relevant for modeling local sea level within the context of, of climate projections. Um, we've kind of had a variety of approaches to projecting land ice contributions to sea level. Um, and, you know, perhaps the oldest of these is really a standalone ice sheet model that's um, these days forced by climate model output. But we also have um, now a variety of coupled modeled approaches. Um, sometimes this is an ice sheet model coupled to a regional ocean model um, with or without a sea ice component. Um, and the latest development has been ice sheet models coupled to climate models. So what I'd like to do in this talk is kind of introduce and motivate why our community has invested in coupled modeling approaches to sea level projection. Um, and I'll talk about what some of the challenges have been. Um, Dan gave us a great introduction to some of these challenges. Um, and I'll try to focus a bit on what research directions we might prioritize next. Okay, so um, to kind of give a brief overview of some of the some of the topics that Dan talked about, we have um, kind of a some some general approaches for um, representing ice shelf melt in uncoupled ice sheet models, um, and I'm going to talk about briefly why these approaches. And it has some shortcomings and aren't um, kind of uh, uh, aren't capable of representing the full feedbacks between ocean and ice dynamics. So we can include some climate variability and change by forcing standalone ice sheet models with thermal forcing output from climate models. So this is on the right hand side some figures from the ISMIP six protocol that show basically that one of the common approaches is to extrapolate a single vertical thermal forcing structure across an entire ice shelf cavity. So, you know, the blue lines in this top panel show the, the kind of vertical structure of thermal forcing for the Filchnerani ice shelf um, for present day and in the future. Um, and on the bottom panel, you see the melt rates that kind of result, result from that of simplified representation of thermal forcing. Um, and similarly for the Amits and C at higher levels of, of thermal forcing. Um, now, clearly this approach doesn't represent all of the effects that ocean circulation can have in distributing water masses unevenly throughout ice shelf cavities. Um, and there are also feedbacks with ocean velocity that we aren't able to capture with these approaches. Um, there are different melt parameterizations that are available, but these have trade-offs in terms of complexity and the melt distribution that results. Um, some, melt some melt distributions end up with, you know, higher melt rates near, near grounding lines and lower melt rates in kind of the far field. Um, and I'll again kind of refer you to Clara Burgard's paper for kind of a deep dive into those issues. Um, but kind of the critical point here is that we can't capture ocean circulation feedbacks on ice shelf melting with, with these approaches. Um, and there is reason to believe that we're going to see significant changes in ocean circulation as water masses coming onto the continental shelf change. Um, you know, perhaps the most dramatic instance of this is modeling of regime change in the Filchnerani cavity if you know, warm circumpolar deep water um, flows onto the shelf increase in the future. Um, and this is the kind of process that we're just not going to be able to capture 
with these standalone um, ice sheet models. Um, so if we kind of employ an ocean model uncoupled to an ice sheet model, we can get at some of these feedbacks between ocean circulation and ice shelf melting. Um, but these models generally don't have any ice shelf geometry changes. So we're missing out on part of the interactions between ice and ocean that are important for determining ice loss. Um, these ocean models generally use the, the scalar, so temperature and salinity and velocity fields um, to drive the melt rate with the three equation model. Other talks, um, both, you know, both in this session and previous sessions, have talked about the three equation model. So I'm not going to go into too much detail here. Um, other than to say that, you know, we get a pretty, a pretty reasonable, you know, simulation of melt rates um, in comparison to observations when we know what the properties um, of temperature, salinity, and velocity are within the boundary layer. Um, but in kind of typical, like standard resolution ocean models, we aren't able to achieve high enough resolution within the boundary layer to get a good idea of what the, what the distribution of temperature, salinity, and, and the vertical structure of velocity is. So modelers are left with making choices about how best to approximate these properties within the boundary layer. Um, and another limitation is that it's you know, not yet standard to simulate tides in most ocean, configuration, ocean model configurations. So usually the tidal component is you know, prescribed with some, you know, with some tidal root mean square velocity. Um, you know, or lacking that, a constant value that serves to just prevent melting from, you know, hitting zero when velocities go to zero. So this is a kind of critical limitation, particularly for understanding what melt rates might look like in the grounding zone, um, which, which Dan touched on in his talk. Um, so here on the right, I've just shown some, some output from our Earth system modeling efforts when we're simulating melt rates in this kind of, you know, using the three equation model uncoupled to ice sheet dynamics, but in an earth system modeling context. And I'll go a little bit more later into what, you know, some of the limitations are with resolution in, in these earth system modeling contexts as well. So to get kind of ice sheet evolution and ocean circulation feedbacks, we, as I mentioned earlier, we've been kind of moving toward a coupled approach to ice ocean simulations. Um, there's been kind of a growing literature and variety of models over the past, you know, roughly five years. Um, I've listed, you know, a bunch of papers here that you can kind of dive into in your free time, but kind of we've gone from Kind of simplified setups like this early paper from Jim Jordan that showed that you know this kind of symmetrical pattern which you reproduced with which you produce with parameterized melting without coupling active um, is not realistic in light of kind of Coriolis forces which tend to favor melt on one side of the ice cavity and by including this coupling you get these large scale asymmetries in melting that are reflective of Coriolis effects. Um, so we've gone from these kind of idealized simulations to um, having a, a, a ice sheet model that's fully coupled in an earth system model and simulating um, coupled interactions between um, ice sheet dynamics and ocean melt over, you know, you're through, through the end of the next century. Um, so what we've kind of learned from these, um, you know, these endeavors so far is generally that, you know, coupled, <laughs> this, this kind of coupled modeling approach works. The results appear to be pretty reasonable. Um, and fortunately, we found that the coupling between ice sheet models and ocean models doesn't have to be fully synchronous. So we don't have to be communicating um, on the ocean model time step which tends to be on the order of tens of minutes, whereas you know, the ice sheet model time step can be much longer on the order of a month. So this is pretty convenient in terms of getting 
kind of the computational tractability that we need for making projections into the future. Okay, so um, the ice shelf melt representations in these coupled models tend to look pretty similar to those in the uncoupled ocean models. Um, and that we're using the three, equation, um, the three equations to figure out what the melt distribution should be. And we're using the ocean model properties to, you know, to come up with the melt rate, but instead of using the usually coarser ocean model grid, we generally use the higher resolution ice sheet model grid so we get a, a higher fidelity um, kind of picture of what melt rates look like. Um, this melt rate is then usually added to the ocean model as a freshwater volume flux. And we have kind of conservative remapping from one grid to the other so that we can you know, retain some possibility of getting um, conservative sea level projections. Um, then there's kind of the, the issue of ice shelf geometry coupling. So typically the coupled ocean models have inherited a prescribed ice shelf geometry change from the ice sheet model. Um, and kind of using this, this kind of general framework on the right hand side, which is the, the FISOC framework for coupling you know, ice, ice sheet models and ocean models. Um, we usually have a lag between the ice shelf geometry changes in the ocean component and those that you see in the ice sheet component. Um, so this means that rather than kind of allowing the ocean to evolve its free surface into newly created volume, instead we have this kind of spontaneous creation of, of ocean um, column as the ice geometry changes. And this requires doing kind of ad hoc things such as extrapolating ocean properties into that newly created volume. And then usually some kind of correction to ensure stability of either of, of the kind of velocity, ocean velocity solution as these new water columns are opened up or closed. Um, so maybe the most kind of concerning aspect of this um, procedure is that it raises the possibility of introducing mass conservation issues due to inconsistencies between the freshwater fluxes that the ocean sees and the geometry changes that the ice sheet model is imposing. Um, so I'm going to kind of transition a little bit into a few slides where I kind of, you know, raise a particular challenge in, in ice ocean coupled modeling and then propose a few research directions. So um, first I'll kind of tackle this, the potential for mass conservation issues um, in this coupling procedure, which can um, obviously pose problems for sea level modeling within a coupled, within a coupled model. Um, and this is of particular concern for, um, you know, for, for climate models and for earth system models that are seeking to um, project coastline evolution globally. So we also want to be able to capture feedbacks between local sea level and grounding line evolution. We need a mass conserving framework to capture those, those interactions as well. Um, so in response to this, we can invest in more sophisticated geometry coupling algorithms. Um, there are kind of pressure-based approaches that can ensure mass conservation by design. Um, we can also make use of the ocean model's melt solution on the ocean model time step, which opens the door to more realistic interactions on the time scale of the ocean model, rather than being constrained by the ice sheet model time step. Um, and then finally, we can also make use of existing algorithms for handling coastal inundation and open coastal areas in ice sheet settings. Um, so on the right here is um, an image of a idealized simulation of, of ice ocean evolution with a thin film under the ice, uh, under the grounded ice, which allows the ocean free surface to propagate and grounding line evolution to happen 
um, hopefully more physically realistically. Um, and this is, has the advantage that now we don't need to extrapolate ocean, you know, ocean properties into, into newly created um, water columns as the grounding line retreats. Um, so one of the major challenges on the kind of coupled modeling side for ocean dynamics is um, limitations in model resolution, which affect the transport of ocean properties um, onto the continental shelf. So this is um, an issue that Nico raised yesterday, um, and I'm just going to kind of highlight it again here briefly. So um, in our Earth system model simulations, um, we have a lot of difficulty capturing um, where warm circumpolar deep water should be present on the shelf and which kind of shelf regions should be dominated by colder, denser water masses. Um, and this is largely attributed to low horizontal resolution, but also means that our parameterizations for mesoscale mixing don't have um, the appropriate um, physics. And this isn't a problem that's unique to our group. There's a large spread um, in, in models between where, where different models predict warm circumpolar deep water coming onto the continental shelf in the future. So this is an issue of confidence in our ability to project um, sea level using these coupled model approaches. Um, and I'll just point out here on the bottom, we also saw this figure in, in Nico's talk that you know, typical model resolutions within an Earth system model mean that for really important ice shelves like Pine Island, so we have only a handful of grid cells representing that ice shelf um, and those ice ocean interactions. So there's a few different kind of routes we could take in response to these challenges, some short term and some longer term. On the short term side, we have, you know, undertaking some kind of ad hoc corrections to ocean biases, um, undertaking some tuning exercises. Um, ideally, these, these tuning procedures would be efficient and reproducible. Um, and focusing resolution in critical regions of the continental shelf where we need that resolution to, to represent these, these processes. Um, in the longer term, we can do quite a bit more kind of ocean dynamics research into the processes that control onshore water mass transport. Um, so, you know, specifically focusing on what controls circumpolar deep water transport. Um, and then use that, use those physical insights to improve our mesoscale mixing parameterizations. Um, we also need to do a better job at representing calving and iceberg melt fluxes. Um, and this is, you know, partly an issue for coupled, you know, for, for coupled models, but also an issue for um, ice, ice sheet models in terms of representing that physics more accurately. Um, and kind of capturing feedbacks on ocean circulation through ice shelf geometry and iceberg melt fluxes, which can impact water mass trans um, transformations. So there's you know, room to improve calving physics on the ice sheet modeling side um, to improve our ocean model stability under calving, so allowing for rapid geometry changes. Um, and then also you know, representing icebergs in the coupled system so that we can capture potential feedbacks on thermal forcing in ice shelf cavities. Okay, so I'll, I'll also touch just briefly on this issue of ice ocean boundary layers being under resolved. Uh, this has been touched on in a number of the previous talks, um, but you know, generally kind of the rule of thumb is that we need at least three kind of vertical levels in an ocean model within the ice ocean boundary layer in order to kind of adequately represent um, the, that vertical structure and get the right inputs into the three equation parameterization. So since we don't have um, you know, those high fidelity inputs to the three equation parameterization, we you know, need to invest in a few different, a few different directions the, you know, the one that's maybe most available to us right now is 
increasing vertical resolution near the ice base in ocean models. Um, there are some methods that can allow us to retain high resolution in the boundary layer as the cavity geometry changes and remove the kind of vertical CFL limit that makes it so expensive to retain high resolution in ocean models. Um, we can also collect more observations of the vertical structure of ice ocean boundary layers so that we have a better sense for what kind of processes and structure we're missing in ocean models to try to compensate for those in parameterization development. Um, we can also develop melt parameterizations that are scale aware, so that can accommodate a wide variety of ocean model resolutions um, and account for the effects of unresolved boundary layer dynamics. Um, and then finally, I think we need to test whether we can reproduce large scale relationships between ocean thermal forcing um, ice shelf melt rates and grounding line retreat. Um, and ideally this would be validated against particular um, observed retreat events and ice shelf geometry changes. Um, we, we generally haven't gotten to the point as a field where we are attempting to reproduce observed, um, they kind of observed events and see how well our models actually perform. Okay, um, so um, that's yeah. I need something, but yeah, feel free to wrap up in a couple of minutes. Okay, okay. So I'll I'll kind of I'll kind of skip over this slide for the most part because I think Dan did a really good job of introducing um, why we need to know the bathymetry better and also the role that um, adjoint models can play in guiding observations to places where the solution is particularly sensitive to knowing, you know, to knowing the, the bathymetry more, more precisely. Okay, so um, kind of to, to wrap up here and summarize, I think that it's, you know, clear that society needs projections of sea level and particularly the ice, the land ice contribution to sea level, um, and that we need to move beyond process studies. Now I'll just kind of quickly <laughs> give my opinion of the kind of greatest open process level issues for sea level projection. Um, I, you know, calving and onshore circumpolar deep water transport can both make orders of magnitude difference to the ice flux that we see um, in the future. So I think that these are some areas that we can prioritize as a community in terms of process level understanding. Um, we, you know, have a lot of work that we can do to kind of get, get the bet most bang for our buck from global climate models, but these are going to continue to be limited by the resolution um, that they're able to achieve for a particular computational cost. So we're going to need to continue to invest in a hierarchy of models at different scales that are capable of addressing different processes and provide regional um, regional projections as well. Um, and then I'll just second Dan's kind of plug for continued work on what level of accuracy is needed and where for ice shelf melt projections to get accurate ice loss projections. Um, and I think there's yeah plenty plenty of more work to do on all of these points, and I'm excited to see you know what what this community is going to accomplish, and you know what Dan said our next our next few waves of PhD students. Thanks for your attention. I look forward to the discussion. Awesome, thank you, Carolyn. That was awesome. Um, any questions for Carolyn? I think we'll plan to go to breakout rooms at thirty at, at five past thirty whatever time zone you're in. Uh, so feel free to ask any questions. Roland. Hi, thanks very much, Carolyn. Um, just recently there was a 
workshop at uh, NCAR on kilometre scale uh, system modelling. So um, what hopes do you have those nasty course resolution pictures that you showed us um, will just get swept up in technological advances? Um, can you still hear me? Yes. Sorry, my, my, my screen display is a little a little funky now when I stop sharing. But um, thanks for your question. Yeah, I, I mean, I think that this is something that we're definitely making progress on. Um, you know, our group is also exploring these, you know, different configurations of our ocean and ice mes meshes that allow us to concentrate resolution in the areas where it's needed to resolve you know, mesoscale mixing processes like on the continental shelf in Antarctica. Um, you know, so that can, you know, take us some of the way, I think, toward capturing, you know, some of the relevant processes, but certainly there's still kind of under, there's still always going to be under resolved ocean turbulence, um, you know, and on the ice sheet side, um, it might be difficult to get the resolution that we need near the grounding line to get those, you know, to get that high fidelity um, behavior. So I guess, you know, that's, I think that's part of the story. And then there's, you know, always going to be room for improving our, our representations of under-resolved processes and parameterizing those. So coming at it from both, from both ends. Awesome.